Jesus said in Matthew 28 verse 19, Go therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Welcome to Go Teach All Nations, bringing you Christ's teachings through Australian and international speakers. And here is today's presenter, Justin Tarosian. It's a wonderful privilege to be here for this weekend, this Alive Summit called Overcomer. And as we uh, dive into our message this morning, I'd like to invite you to bow your heads with me for a word of prayer before we do. Our Father in heaven, we thank you so much that you promise that if we come unto you, that you will hear us and you will answer us and you will show us great and mighty things that we do not know. And so, Lord, we come and we call unto you now and we pray that you would teach us and that you'd speak to us something new from your word and something that will challenge us to rise higher with you. Speak, Lord, for your servants are listening. In Jesus' name, amen. It was a special time in the land of Israel amongst God's people. The call rang throughout all of the camp. All men ages 20 and up were to come and stand in front of their tents to stand and be counted. A census always meant, or almost always meant, one of two things. Either time for tax or time for war. They knew it wasn't time for tax. And so these Israelite men, as they went in front of their tents, knew that it was time for war. It was a somber time, a, a serious time. But at the same time, it was a joyful time because they knew that their victory was guaranteed because the Lord of Heaven's armies led the way. They knew that they would be overcomers because their commander, their general, was God Himself. Friends, today God's call is sounding through the camp and He's calling and wondering if uh, we as men, women, boys and girls, if we will stand and be counted for Christ. We're being called not to a physical war, but to spiritual battle. And we are to stand on the side of Christ. Last night, we heard a powerful message for those who were here. You got to hear the word of God from Precious as well as from Tom. And uh, last night, Tom brought out that there's a group at the end of time. The Bible talks about them in Revelation 7 and Revelation 14, and it calls them the 144,000. And notice with me in Revelation chapter 7, Revelation chapter 7, verses 4 and 5. Here the Bible says, and speak out with me, read the, aloud with me the yellow underlined words, please. And I heard the number of those who were sealed. 144,000 of all the tribes of the children of Israel were sealed. Of the tribe of Judah, 12,000 were sealed. Of the tribe of Ju Reuben, 12,000 were sealed. Of the tribe of Gad, 12,000 were sealed sealed. And it goes on through the 12 tribes of Israel saying, here are God's people at the end of time who will overcome. They're following the Lamb wherever He goes, and they are overcomers because they have Christ, the overcomer with a capital O, living in their hearts by faith. What will it take to be one of this number? What will it take to be well-trained warriors of the cross? What is it that it will take for us to be among this group? Well, we're going to answer that question this morning by examining the lives of two individuals. And we're going to be contrasting the lives of these two uh, people, these two heroes from history's hall of faith. And, uh, you know, there's so much in the Bible that's said about these two individuals that, um, unfortunately, we don't have time to... Uh, to go through all of them. But as we examine in God's Word together this morning, we're going to look at just five snapshots at the life of the first one and see how they contrast with five snapshots from the life, five glimpses into the life of our second character. And we'll gather the message that God has for us today and what it means for us when it comes to being overcomers in Christ. Our first character is the epitome of what the world tells us is true manliness. Samson's story begins before he was born. In fact, the angel of the Lord appeared to Samson's parents before he was even born. And as he did, they told them, he told them that their son's birth would bring them great joy. 
Now, their son was to be a Nazarite. His hair was never to be cut, and he was to be holy from birth. Well aware of the power of prenatal influences, God told his mother not to drink any alcohol and to, what to stay away from and what not to do and what to do in order that the health of their baby was optimum, optimal. It was the best that it could possibly be. In our first snapshot of Samson, it's in Judges chapter 14. And the Bible tells us in verses 1 and 2 of this chapter that Samson saw a woman. She caught his eye. And, you know, he, his hometown, the Bible tells us, if you look at geography, it was right on the border of the Philistines. And Samson was hanging out with people in Timnah that was just across over in the Philistine lands, across the border. And the Bible tells us that he came back to his parents and he actually said, I want to marry this girl. Get it set up for me because she pleases me. Uh, I like her. Get her for me as a wife. This was in the day where families were much more involved in the marriage process than the Western world here today. And listen to what Samson's, um, Samson replied to his parents. Now, his parents knew that God had said, don't marry outside of your faith. If you marry outside of your faith, and by the way, this is still God's standard today. God wants us to marry those that are of like faith. And the reason for that is because when we raise our children, we want to be able to raise them in the fear and the love of God. Isn't that right? And Samson's parents knew this, and they said, look, Samson, we're not supposed to marry outside of our faith. God does not want you to do that. But look at what he told them. It says, Samson said to his father, get her for me. She is the right one for me. Now, Samson's story, as we're going to see, begins and it ends with his eyes. Literally, Samson, in the second half of verse 3, literally in Hebrew, it says this, She is right in my eyes. Samson said, she's right in my eyes. Get her for me to marry. That's what I want to do. Well, sadly, his parents gave in, and there is a little bit of a sad saga that took place uh, after Samson's wedding and uh, even leading up to it. And very sadly, because Samson gave into and desired what was right in his own eyes, it led him down a very dark path. Look at this, um, verse, four, verse 12 of chapter 14 of Proverbs. There is a way that seems right to a man, but what is the end? The end is the way of death. Friends, if we rely on our own eyes, if we rely on our own hearts, our own desires, if we listen to Disney and just listen to our hearts, we're going to end up down a very dark path in the future. Isn't that right? Our lives will become catastrophic, just a mess. One mistake after another after another. We need to depend on the eyesight of one who sees all and knows all. Isn't that right? We must depend on the eyes of God and, and lean upon Him. The first snapshot that we see together reveals that as a young man, Samson rejected the true faith of his parents. In the book, Patriarchs and Prophets, there's this really insightful quote, very powerful. Page 563, just as he was entering upon manhood, the time when he must execute his divine mission, the time above all others when he should have been true to God, Samson connected himself with the enemies of Israel. And notice just one page before it says this, in his what? In his youth, intimacy sprang up, the influence of which darkened his whole life. Friends, and actually young people, the decisions that you make now will affect you for the rest of your life. The good habits that you form will follow you the rest of your life. The bad habits that you begin to form will only compound and get worse unless you turn to the Lord and allow Him to remove those bad habits from you. What happens in our days, the days of our youth, are the most significant uh, for the remainder of our lives. You know, sometimes uh, I've heard people say, and, and I've even said it myself years ago, and you may have said it as well, oh yeah, I was born a Seventh-day Adventist. Someone asked, were you born a Seventh-day Adventist? Yeah, yeah, I was born a Seventh-day Adventist. And friends, what they actually mean is to be born into a Seventh-day Adventist family. If you are born as a Seventh-day Adventist Christian or a Christian of any kind into a loving family that had family worship, that prayed together, praise God. That is a fantastic blessing. Isn't that right? But if you were not, and even if you were, um, actually, if you were not, you kind of have an advantage in this. If you were born into a loving Seventh-day Adventist home, 
then you may get caught up in the idea that you can be born an Adventist. You can be born a Christian just by physical birth. But that's impossible. You must be born again to be a Seventh-day Adventist Christian. We can't be born into a faith, friends. We have to accept it as our own. And if you were raised in a loving Christian home, that's fantastic. But there comes a point at which you have to study for yourself to see if the faith that you were raised in is actually the truth. And as you ask the Holy Spirit to lead you and to guide you, you can trust that He'll lead you not into some truth, but into how much truth? Into all truth. And some of you sitting here today, you're sitting here because you followed the Holy Spirit's leading you into this church from another faith because your family was of another faith background. But friends, Samson's parents, what they believed in their faith was actually the true faith. So Samson, you know, there's nothing wrong with, with choosing a, a faith other than that of your family. God wants us to follow truth and not just people. Isn't that right? But if the faith that we were raised in is actually truth, if you study it and examine and find that it is Bible-based truth, then God wants you to follow it, to love it, to live it. And that is exactly uh, what He wants each of us to do. So we see in our first snapshot once again of Samson that as a young man, he rejected the true faith of his family, the faith of his parents. For our second snapshot, fast forward with me to Judges chapter 15. There Samson was with a bloody jawbone in his hands. The adrenaline was surging through his veins. And as his breathing started to calm and to slow, he looked around him and saw the bodies of 1,000 dead Philistine soldiers. 3,000 of his fellow Israelites were looking on, and they were completely speechless after this miraculous victory that they had just witnessed. Finally, Samson broke the silence and notice what he says. And this is actually Judges 15, verse 16. Ignore that reference, please. He said, with the jawbone of a donkey, I have made donkeys of them. With the donkey's jawbone, I have killed a thousand men. Samson's eye problem continues. And after, finally, just after this, he nearly dies of thirst. And then while he destroys a thousand soldiers, he dies of something as, as weak and simple as dehydration. He nearly dies. And he cries out to God for help. And God breaks up water, in, uh, brings water up out of the ground. And the, God, water, the ground breaks open and water gushes out. And Samson was able to live thanks to God's provision and his miraculous uh, providing of that. But Samson took credit, this shows us, he took credit to himself rather than giving glory to God for what God had done. He took the credit for something that the Lord did. Our second snapshot shows us that Samson failed to recognize God's presence and his providence in the greatest events of his life. And friends, I don't know about you, but sometimes it can be easy to forget about God in the good times. Or when he does something great through us, it can be easy to just let the glory and the credit come to us. But we should always direct glory to Him and recognize His presence and His providence in the good times as well as the bad. For snapshot number three, for snapshot number three, come with me to the top of a hill outside a large Philistine city called Gaza. Samson's conscious, conscience had woken him up at midnight and realizing his guilt, in breaking his vow as a Nazarite, he got up and he left the side of the Philistine prostitute that he had come into the city to sleep with. And when he left the city, the gates were shut. He was stuck. Here he was. He'd gotten himself in this mess, and now he was stuck, completely stuck. Well, God had seen his heart of repentance. He, God saw that, yes, Samson had blown it after 20 years of of successfully leading Israel in, in victory and freedom, Samson blew it and he went into Gaza to sleep with a prostitute. But God recognized his repentance. And as in the mercy of God, he poured out his spirit upon him. And Judges 16 verse 3 tells us what happened. It says, Then he got up and took hold of the city gate and he pulled it up, doors, posts, lock, and all. He put them on his shoulders and he carried them all the way to the top of the hill 
overlooking Hebron. Now, Samson could have just ripped open the doors and walked out, but no. He grabs not just one door, not just two doors, but the posts as well, and he rips them up out of the ground. And instead of just tossing them aside, he puts them on his back and he walks up to a hill outside the city and then he throws them down. As if to say, what, you think a gate can hold me back? You think ropes or chains can hold me? But Samson had gone into that city a slave to lust and sexual pleasure. This, although Samson was was physically free to rip those up and God's spirit had mercy upon him. Even in spite of this, or in spite of this, Samson was a failure that night because he'd been led, led there as a captive to his lust, a slave to sex. This last or this third snapshot of Samson shows us that Samson, though physically free, was a slave to himself. Physically free but he was a slave spiritually. He was a slave to self, a slave to sin. Proverbs 25, 28 says, whoever has no rule over his own spirit is like a city broken down without walls. Why do cities have walls? You can answer. Why do For protection, yeah, for protection from enemies. That's a major reason that cities have walls. And we are like cities ourselves. And uh, when we ourselves have no rule over our spirit, when we have no self-control, it's like being a city with no walls. Anything can just come into our lives and mess us up, and the devil's attacks can succeed. A British statesman named Edmund Burke said, It is ordained in the eternal constitution of things that men of intemperate minds cannot be free. Their passions forge their fetters. Just like the children's story, right? The, the cords, just one little sin, it may not be much, appear to be much, but repeatedly when it happens, it is enough to hold us and we're held in the cords of our own sins. Patriarchs and Prophets, page 567 says this, physically, Samson was what? The strongest man upon the earth. That's huge. But in self-control, in integrity, in firmness, he was one of the what? One of the weakest of men. The truth is that he who is controlled by his passions is a weak man. The real greatness of a man is measured by the power of the feelings that he controls, not by those that control him. Powerful. You know, Samson was physically one of the strongest people. He was the strongest man on the planet. But in morality, in his his ethics and his moral code, he was one of the weakest for our fourth snapshot, second to last, of Samson. We see him lulled to sleep in the lap of Delilah. He may have blown it before, but this time he had gone too far. Because of Delilah's incessant nagging, he finally told her the secret of his power. The barber did his job well. He left no trace of Samson's symbol of commitment to Jehovah, his hair. Judges 16 verse 20 tells us, that he she shouted after his hair was shaved off his head samson the philistines are coming he woke up and thought i'll get loose and go free as always but he did not know that the lord had what had left him just like the seven locks of his hair had been cut from his head samson had been cut off from god in this snapshot we see that samson took his eyes and his mind off of god and let a person seduce him into sin. Sadly, this is the reality when we take our eyes off of Christ. Isn't that right? We will be seduced by the sins of this world, whether it's lust or another one. And our only safety lies in keeping our eyes on Christ. Verse 21 says, The Philistines captured him, and what did they do? They put out his what? His eyes. They took him to Gaza chained him with bronze chains and put him to work grinding at the mill in the prison. This brings us to our last snapshot of Samson before we go to our final character. And here we see him blind, bloody, and shaved bald, grinding grain in a pagan prison. Here Samson was. His story began 
and it now looks like it's going to end with his eyes. Samson at first took a Philistine wife who was right in his eyes and it ends with the Philistines taking out his eyes, blinding him. In our last snapshot, we see that Samson began in a place of leadership, but it ended in the lowest place possible. What a sad, sad story Samson's story is. What a tragic picture of one who God raised up to be a deliverer of his people, one who God had supernaturally strengthened, one who God had especially chosen. And what a contrast to the positive picture of our second character. I know till now the message has been kind of heavy. It's been a serious and a somber one, even a sad one. But it's about to be get a lot better. <laughs> because friends, there is a Bible hero there's a Bible character whose life is a, a stark contrast to the life of Samson. It's a positive picture of what God can do in the lives of those who give their lives to Him. In the first snapshot of this character, we find him at the age of 17 years old. He's terrified and now he's beginning to panic as in shackles he's being hauled off to a foreign country that he's only ever heard about, a place called Egypt. Sold as a slave by his own brothers, no doubt their, their taunts and their, their angry shouts were still echoing in his ears as he was being hauled off to this foreign country, this pagan land. And at the age of 17, just about to enter into manhood, Joseph made a decision that would change the rest of his life from that point forward. Patriarchs and Prophets 2.13 and 2.14 says this, Then his thoughts turned to his father's God, in his childhood, he had been what? He'd been taught to love and to fear him. Now all these precious lessons came vividly before him. Joseph believed that the God of his fathers would be his God. And then and there, he gave himself fully to the Lord. And he prayed that the keeper of Israel would be with him in the land of his exile. Here Joseph was, and he decided to make the faith of his father his own faith. There was nobody else around that shared his faith. But he knew that it was the truth. He knew that God would care for him. And so Joseph, all, while a contrast to Samson who forsook the faith of his family, the true faith, Joseph made the faith of his family his own. Amen? Amen. This is a picture, the first picture we get of Joseph. Fast forward with me a little bit to snapshot uh, number two. It says, now Joseph had been taken down to Egypt Potiphar, an Egyptian who was one of Pharaoh's officials, the captain of the guard, brought him from the, or excuse me, bought him from the Ishmaelites who had taken him there. So here he was sold into slavery. And even though he was in slavery in Egypt, God still blessed Joseph because he'd given his life to him. I just pause to say, you know, it doesn't matter where you are. It doesn't matter your circumstances in life. If you've given yourself to God, you can know that He will bless you. Amen. Not only bless you, but He'll bless others through you. Amen. And this is exactly what happened with Potiphar. He was so blessed in all that Joseph's hand found to do, it was flourishing. And so Potiphar was like, man, I need to put this guy in charge of everything that I own. So that's exactly what he did. In contrast to Samson, in this second snapshot, in contrast to Samson who was physically free but spiritually a slave, Joseph was a slave, but he was spiritually free. Friends, Joseph said, if I have given myself to God, it doesn't matter my outward experience. It doesn't matter my outward experience. But what matters is on the inside, I am spiritually free because I belong to the Most High God. You know, Joseph was literally bought and sold. He was bought by the Ishmaelites. His brothers sold him and then he was sold to the Ishmaelite or to Potiphar from the Ishmaelite traders once they got to Egypt. And uh, this is just amazing to me. Education page, ah, oh, getting ahead. Well, listen to this. Many of you may know the quote by heart. I don't have it on the PowerPoint. But education page 57, while talking about Daniel and Joseph, who were both captives, slaves that were essentially bought and sold and were hauled off to a foreign land, Ellen White pens these beautiful words. The greatest want of the world is the want of men. Men who will not be bought or sold. Men who in their inmost souls are true and honest. Men who do not fear to call sin by its right name. 
Men whose conscience is as true to duty as the needle to the pole. Men who will stand for the right, though the heavens may fall. Friends, no matter Joseph's outward appearance, he was free because in his heart, he was completely surrendered to God. And friends, though the world may say that there is a price at which every person will be purchased, at which every person will be bought, the story of Joseph is a beautiful example that when we are sold out for Christ, we will not be bought out by the devil. Nothing will be able to buy our allegiance to Christ. No matter his outward appearance, Joseph said, I'm going to stand and be counted with Jesus Christ, my Lord and my Savior. I will stand for the one true God. You know, as we, before we head to snapshot number three of Joseph's life, I just want to say, we, we hear these words and we think of the story of Joseph. Him and Daniel, they were literally bought and sold, especially Joseph. He was purchased and he was sold as a slave, but in his heart he was free. And friends, we may have walked into this church, yes, physically free, but in spiritual slavery in one form or another. We may be in spiritual slavery to our taste buds, maybe in slavery to materialism and greed, maybe in spiritual slavery to worldly music and movies that we know are, are against the will of God that are affecting us in negative ways, in slavery to sexual pleasure, in slavery to a bad temper and anger, fits of rage, in slavery in one form or another to something in some form of self, selfishness and sin. But if you walked in here today as a spiritual slave, you can leave as a free person. Because like Joseph, if you surrender yourself to God, you will leave this place as a free man and as a free woman. Because no matter your outward experience, you have an inward experience with God, walking with Him, and He has set you free. Snapshot number three, we find Joseph standing before the king of Egypt, the largest, most powerful kingdom in the world at that time. He had just relayed the meaning of his God-given dreams, of Pharaoh's God-given dreams. He'd given advice for how to prepare for the coming famine after the seven years of plenty. And at this point, the Bible tells us that Pharaoh said this. He turned to his, to his men, to his wise men and all of his counselors, and he said, Can we find anyone like this man in whom is the Spirit of God? Beautiful. He told Joseph, no one else has your God-given wisdom. We need it. And he said, look, you are second in command. You're only second in command to me. And you're in charge of all of Egypt. Friends, he had been in prison for many years at this point. Joseph had. But he'd been faithful in every little thing that God had given him to do. I wish we had more time to go through the story of Joseph. It's worthy of an entire sermon series. It's so hard to do it justice just looking at five of these snapshots of his life. But friends... The opposite of Samson, who began in a seat of honor and leadership and ended in the lowest place possible. Joseph began in the lowest place possible and he ascended to the seat of leadership and honor right next to Pharaoh, in the highest place basically that could be had in the entire empire. Samson, he fell from the highest place to the lowest place because of his failures and Joseph succeeded because of his faithfulness. And because of God's faithfulness to him. God says, to those who are faithful to me, to those who honor me, I will honor. And he is faithful to his word in that. Isn't that right? You know, as uh, we come to our fourth snapshot in the life of Joseph, fast forward with me more than seven years now. There Joseph stood with tears running down his face. His brothers had changed. He knew they had changed because he had tested them and he'd seen the changes in their character. All 12, or all 11 of them actually. And as tears were running down his face, he could bear it no more. And he said, I am Joseph. Does my father still live? And confusion mingled with shock overtook his brothers as they were there. And as they wondered, what? Is this really Joseph? Could this actually be our little brother that we sold into slavery so many years ago who we thought we'd sent off just to die? And in Genesis 45, verses 4 and 5, it says that Joseph responded and he said, It's me, Joseph. 
I am Joseph. Is my father still alive? And he told them, come closer. Come and see. It is me. He was speaking to them in Hebrew, so they knew this couldn't just be any random Egyptian officer, but this must be their younger brother. And notice what he says three times within three verses. He says, he says this, God sent me here. He nearly spent half of his life as a slave and as a prisoner, and yet Joseph told his brothers who sold him into slavery, God sent me here before you. Verse 7, God sent me here before you. Verse 8, it was not you that sent me here, it was God. Amazing. He could have taken revenge on his brothers. He could have had them just wiped out. But he wanted to see if their characters had changed and his tests of them had proven that they had. Joseph chose not to see his greatest trials and greatest difficulties in his entire life as points of misery and, and pain and suffering. Joseph chose to view them as God's providence. He said, God did this. You know, the devil meant it for evil. He told them, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. Our verse that was read earlier from Psalm 105 says, God sent a man before them. God allowed, he overruled all of this for good and for his glory. In our fourth snapshot, we find that Joseph praised God for his presence and his providence in the worst events of his life. Samson forgot about God in the, the greatest events of his life, but Joseph praised him in even the worst. And friends, I don't know about you, but I, I don't want to just praise God when things go well or cry out to him and pray to him when things are going bad. But I want to give glory to God and, and to praise him for his presence and his providence in the worst as well as the best events of life. How about you? Not just going to him when we feel we need something or when we do need something, but going to him and praising him even in the midst of pain and suffering and trials. You know, trials, the Bible tells us, they're actually the workmen that refine our characters. Trials are the very thing. Sometimes we get upset in times of trial. And we shouldn't get upset because these are the very things that God is wanting to use to change us, to, uh, to, to change our characters, to refine us, to transform us. I want to be like Joseph. How about you guys? Amen. You know, before we look at our, our final snapshot of the life of Joseph, I just want to uh, share something briefly, and that's that as we look at the life of Samson, we see he was overcome. He was overcome. He was overcome. He was overcome. Repeatedly, he was overcome. He was overcome. But when we look at the life of Joseph, Joseph overcame, and he overcame, and he overcame, and he did overcome, and he did overcome. And friends, this is a message to us. Every person on the planet has one of two choices. We can either be overcome or we will overcome. We can be overcome by selfishness and the ways of the world and sin, or we can be overcomers with Christ. This is the option that he wants to present to us. And at the end of time, as we were reminded last night from Tom's message, at the end of time, the devil is no fool. We think that, you know, we think that we're safe um, from all of the devil's deceptions. But friends, the devil is saving his best for last. He's saving his his darkest and most confusing deceptions till the end of time. And as he does, you think because you know a few memory verses, you've memorized a few Bible verses, that you're going to be okay. Friends, and I'm speaking to myself as well, we need to have our minds so saturated with the truths of Scripture that we'll be grounded in the truth. We need to be so close with Jesus, walking in connection with Him, that we won't be led astray by the lies of the devil, but that the truth will shine bright and clear and that we will be walking firmly with the Lord. Friends, we can either be overcome or we will overcome. Do you want to overcome today? Amen. I want to overcome as well. And the way that we overcome is that we become like Jesus. You see, he wants every snapshot of our life, every decision, every individual decision that we make, he wants that decision to be a mosaic, to make up a picture of his face. Christ wants our lives and the choices we make and the lives we live to be a reflection of himself, to shine bright for him. And did you know that before we get to our last snapshot, I just want to share this with you. Did you know that God raised up both Samson and Joseph to be types of Christ? 
to be a type of Christ. He, he wanted them to be a picture of the future coming Christ. And I just want to share a few of these with you. They amazed me as I was studying and I discovered them. Uh, but when it comes to Joseph, I just want to share some of these very powerful, how there's so many parallels between Joseph and Jesus. First of all, Joseph was sold for 20 pieces of silver. Jesus was sold for 30. Joseph was sold by his own brothers. Jesus was sold by one of his own disciples. Third, Joseph's holy life brought on the wrath of his unholy brothers. Jesus' holy life brought on the wrath of the unholy religious leaders. Fourth, the same plan which Jesus' brothers tried to get rid of him with was turned around by God to be the very thing that provided them life. And it was the exact same for Jesus on the cross, for the very ones that put him to death. Fifth, Joseph was condemned to a prison based upon false witnesses. So was Jesus. Six, when Joseph had the ability to enact revenge on his brothers who sold him, he let them know that he had forgiven him. Similarly, on the cross, Jesus prayed, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Joseph recognized that God had sent him into Egypt to preserve life. Jesus recognized that God sent him into the world to provide eternal life. Joseph ascended from the prison to the royal palace. Jesus ascended from the tomb to the royal throne. Jesus, Joseph sat at the right hand of the mightiest king on the planet. Jesus is seated at the right hand of the almighty king of the universe. Joseph was reunited with his father after a long separation, and so was Jesus Christ. Joseph, from his position of power, offered forgiveness to his repentant brothers, just as Jesus from the most holy place offers forgiveness to every repentant sinner who reaches out to him in faith. Last of all, Joseph's brothers were given a commission to go and tell the family that Joseph was alive and on the throne. Similarly, Jesus gave us all, the human family, the great commission to go and tell the human family that he is alive and seated at the right hand of the majesty in the heavens. He's seated on the throne of God. Joseph's life was to be a picture of the coming Christ. But God also wanted Samson's life to be a picture of Christ. Very sadly though, because decision after decision led Samson into failing God's, in uh, fulfilling God's will for him. The parallels between Samson and Jesus are very few. Friends, I want to let you know something today. God has amazing plans for your life. There is incredible supernatural potential that he has placed in you, and he has incredible plans for your life. And if you've been in Christian circles or been in church growing up, you've probably heard that many times. God has a plan for your life. God has a plan for your life. And it's true. But you know what's also true? Satan has a plan for your life too. The devil has a plan for your life. He is out to get you. He wants to ruin you. The good news, and praise the Lord, the good news is this. Whoever's plans for your life succeed is not a matter of chance. It's a matter of choice. If we choose Christ, if we choose Him, we will not be overcome in our lives, but we will overcome. You know, as we move to the last, the final snapshot in this, we saved this one to last because it's fair to say that at this moment, the entire future of Joseph was at stake. Everything that had happened in his life was now at stake. In our final snapshot, we see him there in Potiphar's house. His wife had been trying to seduce Joseph to sin for some time. But Joseph's response was, how then could I do such a great wickedness? Excuse me, how then could I do such a wicked thing and sin against God? Joseph loved God so much that he couldn't bear the thought of breaking his heart. He couldn't bear the thought of hurting the God who he loved and served. But day after day, Potiphar's wife kept after him. She was nagging him incessantly. But Joseph stood as firm as a rock to principle. Seeing that he'd made up his mind, she decided to resort to force. And that is exactly what the Bible tells us. In this snapshot, we see Joseph running out of Potiphar's house without his garment, without his clothes, but still with his purity. Joseph held on by principle. He held on to God. And while he ran out, his clothes gone, he was an overcomer. He had overcome. 
even though this could have resulted in Joseph's death, he said, I don't care. I would rather die than do this and sin against God. What a faithfulness. I want to be like that, don't you? In this fifth and final snapshot, we see that Joseph kept his eyes and his mind on God and he refused to let a person seduce him into sin. Opposite of Samson who had taken his eyes and his mind off of God and allowed himself to be seduced into sin. Friends, this is, and it's significant to note this, this was not a one-time thing where Joseph was tempted or even where Samson was tempted. This was a day in and day out nagging and incessant uh, temptation. In Genesis 39.10, it says, When she asked Joseph day after day, he would not go to bed with her. Judges 16.16, Delilah kept on asking him day after day. This, is, uh, uh, this phrase in Hebrew means all the days long, like all day, every day, 24-7, this temptation was coming at them. And friends, temptations may be hammering you. They may be hitting you day in and day out repeatedly. But if you stand firm in Christ, the Bible says, submit to God, therefore, in James 4. Resist the devil and he will what? He will flee from you. You know one of the most powerful things we can do to resist temptation? It's actually the Bible's given antidote for sin. It's in Psalm chapter 119. Thy word have I, what? Hidden in my heart. Why? That I might not sin against thee. Hiding God's word in his heart. This is how God lives in our hearts through faith. One of the major ways that Christ reproduces his character in us is through his holy word. And he wants to do this in our lives. Friends, this was a hinge moment in each of their lives, in Joseph and in Samson. And it wasn't just a, a one mistake. It was the culmination of all of the decisions that they had made up until that moment. Samson blew it. And Joseph succeeded, not because of one right or wrong decision, but because of many right decisions and many wrong decisions that had led up until that time. Friends, this is a principle that it's important to understand. And please, if you remember one thing, well, if you remember two things, let this be one of them from the message. What you don't master, what you don't overcome, will eventually overcome you. If we don't allow God to overcome the things in our lives that are pulling us down, that will eventually be our downfall. But if we allow God to, He'll come into our hearts by faith. He'll change us and transform us to the point that we don't even struggle with that thing anymore. And we look back and go, wow, thank you, Lord. I used to struggle with that. And it's been years, months since I've struggled or years since I've struggled with that. Friends, each time we say yes to temptation, our willpower gets weaker. And each time we say yes to God, our willpower gets stronger. Let's say yes to God. And He gives us the strength to even say yes to Him. You know, if, it, if you're ever struggling with temptation, you're tempted for something, with something, you can pray the prayer, Lord, take my will. Make me willing to be saved. Make me willing to be helped. And God will actually give you a desire to do the right thing. He'll place that in your heart. He'll give you the strength and He'll enable you to overcome. Come back with me. And before we do, I should say, you know, as we've seen, Samson and Joseph were very, very different. They were opposite. In, um, Ellen White calls Samson a mighty weakling. Mighty physically, but one of the weakest men, right? But Joseph was also a mighty weakling. Did you know that? He recognized his own weakness, and he allowed God to be his strength. He allowed God to make him strong. Friends, Samson and Joseph have total opposite examples that we see through this. This is the good news, that though the devil specializes in making strong men and women weak, God specializes in making weak men and women strong. Amen. We must recognize our weakness. As Sharissa shared this morning, we must be overcome in order to overcome. We must let Christ overcome us, fill us, bless us with His presence that we may be strong. Friends, no matter your past, no matter the present, if you give yourself to Him, He will strengthen your heart. He will strengthen your will. He'll strengthen your spiritual life so you can live 
Jesus' life, he can live his life through you. And you will live the life that Jesus would live if he were in your place. This is what God desires to do in each and every one of us, friends. God loves taking weak men and women and making them strong, mighty people of faith. And that's actually what he did with Samson. Let's go back to Judges 16 as we wrap this up. Samson is included in the Hall of Faith in Hebrews chapter 11. Although Samson's story ended in death, praise God, it did not end in failure, but it ended in faith. Judges chapter 16, there Samson was. He was made a laughingstock of 3,000 Philistine lords. It was a feast to Dagon, their God. And they were giving thanks because Samson had been delivered into their hands. Now echoing in Samson's ears was this song. And I imagine that it started off with one person, just this catchy little tune, this little ditty, like a TV commercial tune that you can't get out of your head, sung in mockery. And it began to swell and swell until nearly 3,000 were chanting, and these were their words, our God, has delivered, our God has delivered into our hands our enemy, the destroyer of our land, and the one who multiplied our dead. Samson finally realized, as he looked back over his life, that his life was not about himself. He realized that his life was about God. And this contest was not between Samson and the Philistines. This was between Yahweh and Dagon. It was between the one true God and these uh, false gods that were backed by demons and fallen angels. Samson as he realized the failure after failure that his life had had, couldn't weep because his eyes had been ripped out. But in his heart, he was weeping. And he cried out to God and he said these words, Sovereign Lord, please remember me. Please, God, give me my strength just once more. He asked to be brought to the center pillars of the temple. And there at the foundation, he put his hands on them. And with all of his weights, he pressed forward onto these and he prayed that God would strengthen him just once more. And the Bible tells us that as he pushed and the Spirit of God came upon him, that those pillars were broken and moved out of place and the entire temple came crashing down. 3,000 Philistine leaders lost their lives. And the name of God who had been disgraced was vindicated. In Samson's death, he was victorious because his last act was an act of faith. Samson's story tragically began and it ended with his eyes. He was led by the lust of his eyes and he ended up losing his eyes. Dark and sad are the closing pages of the final chapter of Samson's life. But praise God and don't miss this. That chapter doesn't end with the end. It ends with to be continued. Because Samson's story will continue in glory when Jesus returns. Friends, praise the Lord when he sees Christ face to face, when he is there on that day when Jesus returns and he has his brand new eyes, the first thing that he's going to see is the face of Jesus. And as Samson is there, the last thing he would have seen with his old eyes was the face of his persecutors, the face of his enemies. But the next thing he sees with his new eyes, it's going to be the face of his Savior, the face of his Redeemer. What a beautiful reminder. What a beautiful reminder of redemption Samson's new eyes will be throughout all of eternity. And along with Joseph and all the redeemed, instead of singing together, we shall overcome someday. We're going to sing when Jesus returns. We have overcome today. Amen. Christ will have come to airlift his people home, to take us to the place where we will spend an eternity with him. And I bet that throughout the ceaseless ages of eternity, as we sing the songs of Moses and of the Lamb, and as we sing the hymns that we have known and loved here, I bet Samson is going to sing with greater strength and energy and passion and fervor than any of us the words of the song of Amazing Grace. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. Friends, praise God. Praise God that on that day when Jesus returns, 
by the mercies of God alone, Samson will be there, an overcomer. Praise God for the picture that we've seen today, the contrast between these two Bible characters. Friends, as we've seen from these two, in order to overcome, in order to be victorious, in order to be prepared and ready for Jesus to return, our lives must reflect His character. The way that we come to know Him, the way that He dwells in our hearts through faith is through the written Word of God. And then He, the living Word of God, comes and dwells in our hearts through the Holy Spirit. We come to know Him. We come to love Him. We come to want to serve Him more fully through the powerful messages of this book, His Holy Word. Today, if you want to say, Lord, I don't want to be overcome. I want to overcome. I recognize that I can only be an overcomer by reflecting the character of Jesus. I can only overcome in Christ's strength. If you want to say, Lord, I recognize that I am weak, but I want you to make me strong. The way that God tells us we are officially united with Him, so that we can overcome sin and death and be raised to walk in newness of life is giving our lives to Him in baptism. And there are some today who are here and you've not yet committed to give your life to God in baptism. Maybe you've been coming to church for some time and it's something that God has been speaking to you. It's something that you know He's, he's wanting you to do. But you've not yet stepped out and said, Lord, I'm going to surrender my all to you and be baptized. If that's you today, I just want to invite you to raise your hand where you are. If you'd like to say, Lord, I've not yet been baptized and I want to surrender my life to you in baptism. Amen. Maybe you're a young person here today. You've been raised in this church. And as you've been raised in this true Bible-based faith, you realize now it's time for you to study for yourself, to examine and to see if this is indeed God's truth. And you want to surrender your life to the Lord, not saying now, not saying this afternoon or tomorrow even or next week. It may be a few years down the line if you're seven or eight years old. But if you want to say today, Lord, I'm responding to your spirit and I want to give my life to you in baptism, go ahead and raise your hand where you are. Amen. Amen. God bless you, sisters. For those who may be studying the Bible currently, and you've already made that commitment, I want to invite you to raise your hand where you are. And if you've raised your hand, go ahead and, and keep it raised. Praise God, brother. Praise the Lord, sister. Amen. Amen. Keep your hand raised, and let's bow our heads together as we pray. Father in heaven, thank you so much that you have overcome and because Jesus has overcome we can overcome too we don't want to be like Samson Lord we want to be like Joseph because Joseph was like Jesus make us more like you Lord transform us to be more like you for all those who have raised their hands and committed to be baptized or who are already on that journey I pray that your spirit would bless them in a mighty way fill them with your spirit and Lord Thank you so much for the promise that you will return very soon to take us to our heavenly home for eternity. May each of us standing here and all of our loved ones be there on that day, we pray. In Jesus' precious name, amen. This message was made available by the Watara Seventh-day Adventist Church. For more resources like this, visit waitarachurch.org.au.
This is Be Like Jesus from Fountain View Academy. Teach me, Father, what to say. Teach me, Father, how to pray. Teach me all along the way how to be like Jesus. Be like Jesus, this my soul in the home and in the home. Be like Jesus all day long. I would be like Jesus. Teach me how we may be one like the Father and the Son. And when all is overcome, I would be like Jesus. Be like Jesus, this my song. Let's listen to William Ackland as he shares a psalm from his paraphrase of the Bible called The Gift. Another psalm of three verses, Psalm 134. Praising the Lord in his house at night. Sing praises to the Lord, all you servants of his, who wait upon him in his house at night. Raise your hands as you adore him, and bless the Lord in his sanctuary. May the great Creator God, who made heaven and earth, bless His people from Zion. It's been a pleasure bringing you this program here on 3ABN Australia Radio.